This video is sponsored by Blinkist. Go to Blinkist.com slash The Plain Bagel to get a week for free plus 25% off a full year subscription. One of the ultimate goals of researching a stock is trying to figure out what the heck it's worth, <laughs> what you think it should be trading for, or what its intrinsic value is. By estimating some sort of price that you think it's worth, you can compare that to what it's currently trading for to determine whether the stock is overvalued or if it's a good buying opportunity. The problem is, of course, getting that number, <laughs> figuring out what that intrinsic value is. There are a number of different methods for trying to get to this number. Multiples is one option. That's kind of a quick and dirty approach. But one of the more detailed and defensible approaches is the DCF or discounted cash flow model. This is how many professionals and experts value businesses to determine what they're willing to pay for them. And while it is a pretty involved process and probably more advanced than the stuff I usually cover on the channel, understanding how it works will give you a pretty good appreciation for what people are paying for stocks. And if you do so correctly, it can give you a good base for judging a position that you're interested in. So let's go over what the DCF is and how you can use it to judge a stock's value on today's plain bagel. Today's video is going to be a high level overview of what the DCF model is and the steps involved with putting one together. I'll be sticking to the basic definitions to help you develop a solid conceptual understanding of how the DCF works. And while I will point out how to get certain data points and how to calculate certain things, I won't be diving as deep as I could into how certain forecasts and assumptions are made for the sake of saving time. But if there is interest in me going through a step-by-step -step example and maybe diving further into those details, do let me know in the comments section down below and I will put together a second video to go through the steps that I will mention in today's video. But before jumping into what the DCF actually is itself, I do wanna highlight that as a method for estimating a stock's value, it is far, 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 far from perfect. <laughs> the DCF model is only as good as the estimates that you put into it. And because a lot of these estimates are going to be based on rough forecasts and assumptions that probably will not pan out in the future, you just shouldn't put any undue weight on the figure that you end up with through a DCF model. But with that being said, the DCF is still a great way to rationalize the current stock price of a company to see what sort of estimates the market is baking into the stock price. If for example, you include very conservative estimates in your model and end up with an intrinsic value that's still well above the current share price, then you can have greater confidence that the position is attractively priced. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the DCF model. All right, I know it doesn't look all that complicated, but this is a deceptively involved model. So let's start at the high level of what's going on here. With the DCF, we are essentially valuing a business based on its future cash flows. We forecast the cash flows for year one to year two, et cetera, et cetera, all the way to year end, which is theoretically when the business stops operations. Now, most of the time people actually use this version of the model where we forecast for some years as opposed to an infinite number of years, and then simplify the cash flow estimate from that point forward with this function here. This section here underneath is how we discount the cash flows. And we do this to A, account for the time value of money, since the longer it takes for us to get the money that we want from the business, the further we should discount this amount since it's less attractive than money today, and B, to account for the cost of capital. Now, I'll jump into the cost of capital later, but for now, you just need to know that this is how we discount the cash flows hence the name of the model. Now, to explain why this formula gives us the value of a company, let's imagine a fake example. Imagine you were to buy a money printing machine. We'll ignore the catastrophic implications for inflation here. <laughs> how much would you be willing to pay for this money printing machine? Chances are you wouldn't care what it's made of, how it looks, or anything like that. You also wouldn't care about how much money it's printed in the past, since that went to its previous owner. You would only care about how much money this money printing machine will give you from the moment you buy it and onwards. So in determining what you'd be willing to pay for it, this would likely be the main focus of the function that you calculate. The same idea applies to how we value a business. As a rational investor who only cares about making money, which we all should be, <laughs> all we should care about is how much money our investments will generate for us from the day we buy it and onwards. There are some models that consider other things. There are some that focus on how much the assets are worth if the company were to sell everything off. But for a going concern business, the DCF is a more appropriate method. So that's an overview of the DCF model. Now let's get into the steps involved with putting this all together. The first step is to forecast our cash flows. Naturally, cash flows, as you may know, represent the actual cash a business is generating from its operations. 
And there are actually two options here for the cash flow figure that we're using. The free cash flow to firm, aka unlevered free cash flow, and free cash flow to equity, aka levered free cash flow. Free cash flow to firm is how much money the company generates for all of its investing stakeholders, meaning both shareholders and bondholders or the lenders. While free cash flow to equity is just the amount of money generated for shareholders or us. Now you can use either method here, but I'm going to focus on the free cash flow to firm since I think it provides a better conceptual framework of how the DCF works. And the two should lead to a same or similar result. But with the free cash flow to firm, we do need to make some adjustments at the end to get to our estimated share value. So do keep that in mind. Now, estimating the free cash flow to firm is by far the longest step of the DCF. You first need to forecast the company's income statement, including their revenue forecasts and expenses, all the way down to their earnings before interest and tax, or EBIT. This usually means taking the latest year of actual results as your starting point and tacking on some sort of growth assumption to each line item. A lot of people will do their research into forecasting sales and then base operations on some percentage of the sales forecast. Once we do this and get all the way down to our EBIT for a given year, we make the following adjustments to get to our free cash flow to firm. We first deduct taxes, since that's obviously something we don't get to keep and pay out to the government. And then there's this whole part here, where we're basically reversing accounting rules to try and extract a cash flow from our earnings figure. Depreciation and amortization is a smoothed out expense for a company's mm -hmm. capital expenditures, which is how much money the company has actually invested into fixed assets, a figure that you can grab from their cash flow statement. So we want to reverse that smoothing out expense by adding back appreciation and amortization from the income statement, and then subtracting the money that the company has actually spent on its business and its fixed assets. As for increases in working capital, you can view this part as being how much money the company is investing into their current assets that it will need to operate its business. It's calculated as the current assets minus current liabilities for this year, minus the same figure from last year but we actually keep out cash and current debt, which we'll bring into the model later on. So CapEx is what money the company needs to invest into their fixed assets to keep operating and to keep their growing going. And increases in working capital is what the company, again, needs to invest in things like inventory and supplies to meet their business demand. Obviously, both these things will reduce the profits left over for us as investors. So we do need to estimate them and subtract them from our cash flow figure. Again, you can really go to town with the method you use to estimate these figures, going through the company's filings and their balance sheet. But I'll just stick with the simple averaged percentage of sales method for the sake of the example. So we forecast these numbers, subtract them from our estimate, which leaves us with our free cash flow to firm. Now, the second step once we've done that for all of our years is to forecast a terminal growth rate. As we mentioned, we don't want to have to forecast an infinite number of cash flows. So it's common to forecast anywhere from five to 10 years of operations, and then to assume a constant growth rate thereafter to simplify our model moving forward. By doing so, we calculate a terminal value, which is this part of the DCF model over there. And this represents how much the company is worth from that point in time moving forward, assuming that it does grow at that constant rate that we highlight. Most of the time, people will assume that the growth rate will reflect the GDP growth rate of the country where the company operates, since there's an assumption that there will be a convergence towards an average. So it's common to have a low single digit growth rate here. It's not very defensible to assume a company will achieve double digit growth rates indefinitely with the terminal value assumption. So try not to be too optimistic with that part. Once we have our terminal growth figured out, the third step is to calculate our discount rate. The rate we use with a free cash flow to firm is the weighted average cost of capital, or WAC. This is essentially an average rate of return required by the company's bondholders and their shareholders, aka us. Remember, both investors and debt holders have claimed to this free cash flow, so we need to calculate the return that both parties will demand from the company. The rate of return required by bondholders is easy enough because it's the interest rate that the company pays on its debt. And because the interest rate that the company pays to its bondholders is tax deductible, we include this tax factor. Basically, all this is doing is slightly lowering our cost of debt to consider the fact that the money paid towards the bondholders will reduce the company's taxable income. So on a net basis, it will give us some advantage to having debt versus equity. Now, the return on equity is a bit more of an abstract figure. It's basically whatever investors demand from the company. So it's whatever we decide. It will be higher or should be higher anyway for higher risk companies and lower for safer and more mature firms. To estimate this amount, you could start from 8% as an example and simply adjust to reflect the risk of the cash flows that you're estimating. 
Any company that's forecasting cash flow growth above 20%, for example, should probably have a cost of equity well above 8%, since there's a lot of downside to that sort of estimate. There is a more structured way to calculate this number as well, known as the capital asset pricing model. And while I'll toss up the formula here, I'll leave a link in the description below to a page with more information on that if you wanna learn more about that. For the purpose of saving time, I'm just gonna skim over it here. But essentially, it's just a method for calculating the return you should demand as the investor. Now, once we know our cost of debt and equity, we simply do a weighted average of the two, where the equity weight is the company's market capitalization, or the sum of the value of all shares outstanding, divided by total capitalization, which is market cap plus total debt from the balance sheet. So it's essentially how much capital is invested in the company, if you will. And the debt weight is the debt divided by that same denominator. Now, importantly, if the company has preferred shares or any other sort of financing security, this would be included in another component of the WAC formula. But again, for the purpose of saving time, I'll just throw up the formula here and include a link in the description below if you'd like more details on that. Now, at this point, we should have values for all of our variables in our model. So step four is to calculate the discounted cash flow for the company. This will give us the company's enterprise value, how much all of its debt and equity is worth. Now, obviously we don't want that value for the whole company, but rather what belongs to us as the shareholders. So step five is to adjust this to get our share value. There are essentially three parts here. First, we subtract all other interests in the company so that we're left with what belongs to the shareholders. This includes subtracting the total debt, preferred shares if they have any, and minority interests. For total debt and preferred shares, you would ideally use the market values here as opposed to their book values, but that can be hard to find and is outside the scope of this video, so I'll just include a link in the description below if you want to learn more about those. And minority interest refers to how much of the company's subsidiaries are owned by other companies and investors. So obviously we want to take that out as well since that doesn't belong to us. Now the second part is to add the cash and cash equivalents from the balance sheet to our value here. So far we've only valued the company based on its future cash flows, but if the business does come with cash, we should account for that in the price. If your money printing machine were to come with $1 million already printed in its slot, you would probably pay up to an extra million dollars for that machine. And finally, we divide this figure by the total shares outstanding, which we can find in the company's filings as well, and we now have an estimate of the intrinsic value of the stock that we are analyzing. Now, as I've hopefully demonstrated, there were a lot of estimates and forecasts that went into this figure, so chances that it's perfectly accurate are pretty slim. But if anything else, the DCF lets you see what a company would be worth under different assumptions, so that you can better gauge the price you're paying for the stock today. In fact, a lot of analysts will do some sort of sensitivity analysis where they show the output of the model under different assumptions, which is a great practice for providing a good range of values to compare to the current stock price and see whether the stock is fairly priced, overvalued, or an undervalued buying opportunity. This video is sponsored by Blinkist, a mobile app that summarizes nonfiction books on everything from investing to philosophy. And if you enjoyed learning about the DCF and want to dive into other topics, whether they be investment related or otherwise, you might enjoy their app. Blinkist lets you read or listen to summaries of all sorts of different titles in usually under 15 minutes. And I use it a lot to go over books that I don't think I'll get to otherwise. I just recently listened to Buffettology, which is written by Warren Buffett's daughter-in-law and goes over his investment process. And on the complete opposite end, I recently listened to Meditations, which is a book from 170. AD written by this guy about philosophy. But maybe you don't want the summary, maybe you want to go through the whole book from front to back. I get it, some books deserve that attention. But the cool thing is Blinkist does have audiobooks on their platform that members get a discounted price for. So if you want to listen to a book while cooking or cleaning the house or whatever, it's really handy for that. And the cool thing is you can browse their entire library before committing to making an account. So check them out, you can use the link in the description below to get a one week free trial of the service and 25% off the annual subscription fee. Thank you for watching. I hope you found some value in this video. Obviously it was a higher level overview of the DCF, but as you can imagine, it would take some time to go through all the different variables and how they can be forecasted and estimated. But as mentioned, if there is interest in me going through an example in a future video, please let me know in the comment section down below, as well as any feedback you have for the video. As always, thank you for joining me today. And go value a stock. Or not. I don't care. <laughs> Thanks for joining.